Um, I hope these will be helpful to you. My goal here is to just kind of get you ready for the upcoming field season, I guess you might say. Use this downtime to do something productive and, and kind of remind us about uh, all the good things we're going to be seeing this summer, we hope. So uh, there's quite a, you know, there's going to be eight of these. As Lance said, they're over 10 weeks. There's got a couple of weeks we're going to take a little bit of a break. And um, if Lance reminds me or if I forget, we're going to try and take a little short break around 7.30 or so just to give you a chance to, to stretch and get up and do something if you need to. And I'm, I'm fine if, if we get two or three questions in chat, we can just go ahead and stop and take those questions at that time because they're probably you know, dealing with something that we've just gone over. So that might be the best time to do it. I thought we would start with plant family identification because if you, you know, want to learn how to identify plants, uh, this is one of the, the steps that you need to really work on. If you can identify what family a plant is, uh, that you know, gets you a, a long ways to getting a name on that plant because it really narrows down the list of, of how many plants there are. There's, 1800 some plants in, in the state. So getting it now down to family is, is a big help. It also helps you see, and this is a goal of mine, helps you see the relationships among plants, uh, the interconnection, because again, that's really what taxonomy is all about. It's, it is giving a name to plants, but plant taxonomy also strives to show the phylogenetic relationships uh, that plants have. Here's a few of the resources I use tonight. I always uh, want to give credit to uh, the images. The images there are those four at the very bottom. Uh, some of my images are on here too. And I'll just say real quick that um, when I gave Lance's description, I, I was thinking that you know I would I would take an approach where I might be able to get through maybe 50 plant families or something. I was just going to really just go down and give you kind of just a real quick. Uh, gestalt kinds of things that would help um, help pin down what that family was. But then I got to think, and that's probably not a very good strategy, really, because I'm going to assume in all of these classes that there's a fair number of people who are at the beginning level, because uh, I think this is this is one of the, the um, goals that Lance has, certainly, to, to provide an introductory level. And if I just kind of throw out some of my gestalt kinds, kinds of things, I'm, I'm not sure how much help that would be. So so we're not gonna try and do that many plants. Uh, this plant families, I mean, there's gonna be about 20 or so. To get started, let's take a look real quick at again, how plants are classified. If you, you, know, if you had some uh, botany and you probably know some of this, I'm gonna turn on my pointer here, I think. Uh, yeah, so we have these um, taxa here. This shows an example of names that would be suitable for each of those taxa if we were classifying this plant here, which is yellow lettuce, Lactuca canadensis. And you can see one thing that's important here is that each of the taxa above genus level here has a prefix and a certain suffix that goes into the name. And all of these suffixes, suffixes of course, are always the same for each taxa. The prefix is always representing a genus that's in that taxa. I took a look on uh, the most recent paper I could find, this 2016 paper, to see just kind of where we stand now with the number of plants and how they might be broken out by their different groups here. Latest estimate, 330,000 plants or so known in the world, and they're broken out, you know, in terms of vascular, non-vascular, obviously mostly va vascular plants, and then of course mostly flowering plants. In fact, about 90% of the plants are flowering plants. And then um, monocots, dicots, and then the, the ancestral forms here. To start classifying plants, and, and there's at least two taxa that would be, <clears throat> excuse me, helpful for you to really know here, and that would be what division a plant is in. There's 12 divisions. And then, and then as I said, what family the plant's in. Well, there's 400 plant families at least or so to account for all those 330,000 plants. So that's a lot of plant families, of course, to learn. We're just gonna focus on those that are in Iowa. And here are a few plant family names. I always like to point out that when you start working with plant families and seeing plant families, you know, you're always gonna be seeing that ACE 
ending on the plant family name, except for these eight right here. And this is happens to be eight plant families that were given a, a plant family name that did not or does not conform to the, the current rules about how names have to be applied. So these eight families have two, two names. Although again, the ones on the left are the ones that are uh, technically the correct name. I took a look at uh, Eilers and Rosa real quick to see, um, a, get a breakdown of how many plant families are in Iowa, and roughly how many species. So here's the list, 141 plant families, roughly 1,886 species or so. That includes native and non-native. So that's a long list of plant families. And obviously um, we can just do a little bit of work on this, this group. So I figured, well, what makes the most sense, of course, is to look at those plant families that would be the most useful, of course, uh, account for, for most of the species. As you can see, uh, there's something like 50 or so plant families here that are only represented by one or two species. So you know, those are, those are plant families that you're not probably gonna encounter very, very much. So the ones, the top 10 here are in the, the red box, but um, I wanna make a quick note on a couple of these. Scrofulariaceae you know, is a big one in Eilers and Rosa, but not anymore because the, the new revision of that family has put most of those species into other fa families. In fact, um, there's only really now just two genera and six species that are truly in the Scrofulariaceae. So uh, it was uh, greatly diminished. Another one that's, that's changed a lot is Liliaceae. Uh, depending upon which taxonomic scheme you go with, um, there can be you know more or less uh, species in that group too, and that's generally true for a lot of these plant, plant families. Really, what we're you know, we're we're trying to hit a moving target in some of these um, cases because there's this continual work, of course, that revises the phylogenetic relationships among plants, and so it's you know, not surprising that things get changed. And uh, I'll be mentioning some of those other changes as, as we go. So we're gonna take a look at those that have the blue asterisk and try to give you a sense of, again, how to quickly cite ID those. But before we do that, I've, I found a couple of websites that might be helpful to you. I don't know if you've ever seen this one. Uh, the website is listed there. This is, a, it's called a polyclave key. Basically, there's 180 different characteristics listed on this website. You can see how they're broken out here. And you just go through this and you check boxes. If you're looking at your plant, you check a box that fits your plant. And supposedly then when you submit your form, you know, it'll sort through this database and it'll give you a, a smaller group of potential plant families. Well, I've never used this. So I tried it real quick before um, the workshop started here about 20 minutes ago and I put in characteristics that would fit the Violaceae family should be a pretty easy one. And it did not come up. <laughs> so I don't know for sure how much, um, I guess how much faith you can have in, in this. Worth a try at least, I guess. Another website is um, this one here by Thomas uh, Eppel, I guess is how you pronounce his last name. Uh, he has uh, a website here that as he's saying here, learn to identify plants by families that will forever change the way you look at plants. Uh, this guy is um, director of Green University LLC out in Pony, Montana. He offers classes on wilderness survival, botany, foraging, sustainable li living. Uh, and he got a real early interest in plants from his grandmother. His grandmother taught him about edible and medicinal plants. And, and so he's tried to develop this um, system, I guess you might say, or at least uh, the focus on identifying plants to their family. He sells this book called Botany in a Day. Again, I don't have any of these, so I don't know for sure how useful they are, but what the heck, you know, if you want to take a look at them, it, it might, it might uh, be something that would help. I know this website has a few, um, slides basically like I'm gonna be showing you that show basic characteristics for about, I think he's got about eight or 10 families there. He is, he is sort of right when he says, if you can identify, uh, know how to identify the plants in these eight or 10 families, um, that will go a long ways to helping you figure out what uh, plant you're looking at. Um, 
probably at least 50% of the plants or so, because 50% of the plants or more belong to those uh, eight or 10 uh, plant fa families. Okay, uh, I'm gonna be showing you the slides again that have um, some information kind of as, as succinct and concise as I could put together. I wanna remind you that when you're talking about plant families and characteristics that identify plant families, the main and most important ones and most of the diagnostic ones are gonna to have to do with the flowers. Now there's gonna be some other vegetative characteristics that will help too, and I'll be pointing those out, but it's the flowers that are the most conserved in, in, sen in, the, term, in the sense of evolution. And, and again, they provide the most information um, you know, that's useful in figuring out what, what, what family or what order or what even what class a, a plant should, should, should belong to. Now I'm gonna show you again, uh, some diagrams that use floral diagrams. I, I, I like these, I use these in my field botany class because a floral diagram is a, a representation of what the plant flower looks like and what's, how the plant flower is arranged and such. And it's, it's a lot easier to look at that floral diagram than look at a bunch of words, of course. And so in these floral diagrams, this is the key basically here. You'll see again, each of these, um, representations here is, is a flower part. So sepals look like that. Petals have this little not, a notch on the back there. Stamens are just a double circle or sideways eight. Uh, we won't worry too much about staminodes and nectaries. We will be paying a little bit of attention to the ovaries. So superior versus inferior. What that means is basically, it's really not that hard to see in, in a flower. A superior ovary uh, is the is where the ovary sits above where the petals, sepals, and even the stamens are attached. So these two examples show that. This flower up here has an ovary that is su superior. An inferior ovary, uh, and these are less, much less common, is situated so that it's located below the place where, again, sepals, petals, and stamens are attached. Another thing will be that you'll see in these diagrams, although I, I didn't use it very much in the um, notes that I made, is what the placentation is. Placentation has to deal with how the ovules, which are where the eggs are located inside the ovary. Uh, of course, it's the eggs, again, that get fertilized by sperm in order to make a seed. So an ovule turns into a seed. It, it shows how the ovules are arranged inside the, the car, excuse me, inside the ovary. So the main ones are these two right here, really. Axile, we have a, an ovary that's composed of three carpels that are fused together and the ovules are arranged um, and, and located in the center. If the carpels uh, fuse together in an open position, then the ovary looks like this and it doesn't have any chambers. This has three chambers, as you can see, two ovules in each one there. This one doesn't have any chambers because it, the ovary fused together in a different way. And so the ovules are around the outer edge. So axile and parietal, those are the two main kinds. If things are joined or fused together, you'll see they're connected. And we'll, we'll take a look at, um, you know, I'll kind of go through the first couple of diagrams with you and show you again what, what the diagram is showing. Another important uh, characteristic in many families is this thing called a hypanthium. And that's shown by these, these crosshatched lines that are really close together. We see two examples over here. Uh, a hypanthium is just basically a, a floral cup. Think of it as a floral cup. What happens is the, the lower portions of the stamens, the, the filaments in general, lower portions of petals, lower portions of sepals all fuse together to make a, you know, a, a rather sort of thick tissue that, again, we're looking at this in cross-section, but forms a, a round cup that inside that cup is where the pistil sits. Pistil, again, is the female part of the flower. All right, well, let's take a look at the first family here. And I, I'm sure that many of these families, many of you know, and, and, and it's very true that many of these families really don't, we don't need to spend much time on because they're not that hard. Um, so hopefully, if you know some of this stuff already, this will just help can confirm what you already know. But the buttercup family is certainly an important one. And you know, let's take a look at this 
floral diagram right here. And then there's some other diagrams here. I left the labels in for these diagrams so you could read them, of course. But what this floral diagram is saying to us is that there's lots and lots of um, carpels, basically simple pistols right here in the center. That's what those are. Lots and lots of stamens. And then there's one, two, three, four, five, four or five petals and four or five sepals. And that's what I'm basically saying right here. Uh, in the buttercups, there's usually four too many sepals. Most often they look like a petal. Um, the number of petals can vary again from genus to genus, either there's none or there's four or five. Radial versus bilateral means uh, whether the symmetry is radial, is you know, coming out from a, a, a center point. And so it's uh, symmetrical no matter which way you cut it or bilateral means there's only one way that is symmetrical and that's you know up up and down and another thing i should tell you is that when i'm trying to you know summarize this information as best i can without writing a lot the rate when you see a, a characteristic that's italicized that means that is a characteristic that applies to most of the species. It's, it's usually a good character. It applies to most of the species. If it's underlined, it means it's something that does is seen sometimes. And if it's just printed as normal, then that's a really good characteristic. So it's just a way of kind of uh, saying that, uh, for example, bilateral. Well, most of the Ranunculaceae are radial. They have a symmetry like we see right here. But there are some that are bilateral, like, like Larkspur, right down here. But more of them look like, like this. But I think that the thing that really, again, is the gestalt thing here, for the most part, is, is again, the large number of stamens, large number of simple pistils. These are all carpels, but they're not fused to any other carpels. And so they're, they're called a simple pistil. Uh, I'll mention what kind of fruits it has, but the, those aren't usually that diagnostic. And I usually say something about the leaves, but again, a lot of times the leaves don't help a lot because the leaves vary a lot. Just to remind you what a simple versus compound leaf looks like. Simple leaf looks like this. It just has one photosynthetic um, blade, if you will. A compound leaf has the photosynthetic surface of the leaf divided into separate segments called leaflets. And where, where the leaf starts is always determined by where there's a bud. Where there's a bud, the bud's located in the leaf axle. That tells you that's the base of the leaf. So you're looking at a single leaf from that point on out. That's how we know that this is a compound leaf and it's not a branch with five um, simple leaves. And also leaf arrangement then, um, alternate one leaf per node, opposite two leaves per node. Next family is the mustards. This is a big family and many of the species are somewhat weedy. Uh, the, the, the big clue here, and again, you can look at this floral diagram, you can see there's four petals and four sepals. Now there's a few other families like that, but for that, comp, that, that characteristic combined with usually six stamens, four plus two means four of them are taller, two of them are shorter. And we can see the six stamens here. That characteristic again is a great gestalt for the mustards. Now, other things that are important in this family are the fact that there's two carpels and they are fused. We see them fused right here. But in, what happens is, because it's fused in an open position and it has parietal placentation, um, there shouldn't be really any chambers here. But there is a chamber, <laughs> there are two chambers because a false septum forms. What happens is, again, there really is just one chamber to begin with, but then the placenta tissue, these red dots are the placenta tissue where the ovules are attached. The placenta um, has some tissue that outgrows and forms a wall that separates the ovary into two chambers. But that's, that's a false septum because it's not formed in the normal way. The other thing about this family is the fruits, the silicos and siliques. They're, they're usually long slender fruits. 
Uh, some, sometimes it can be short though, like this one up here. And you can usually see the replum actually, or the false septum a lot of times, because what will happen is the, the outer portion of the fruit wall will fall, up, will fall away from the fruit, like it's, like it's happening right here. And you can see the replum right here in the center with the ovules attached along the sides. There's really, again, not a whole lot about the leaves we can use. They're usually simple. They're often lobed, which means they're divided into lobes, um, sometimes compound too. This family has glucosinolates. These are the chemicals that gives mustards their sort of bitter, bitter taste, which actually uh, research has shown can be quite uh, advantageous for us as humans because it has quite a few beneficial health effects, but it's it's something that uh, is not so beneficial for mammals to eat. So they're used to help uh, prevent mammals from grazing. Next group is the mints. And, and this is one that I'm sure, you know, most of you won't have any problem with, uh, but I wanted to include it. Again, the, the gestalt here mainly, of course, is the, the square stems that are most, most of the time are gonna be true. The, the minty uh, aroma that comes from the tissue the um, bilateral and bilabiate flowers also helps a lot, of course. Bilabiate means that the fusion of the petals happens in a way that gives the flower sort of an upper lip and a lower lip. And we can see that here as well on marsh hedge nettle, the lower lip down here, the upper lip right, right here. Uh, there's some other things. The, the fruit is this thing called a schizoscarp, carp, but breaks apart and, and then you can see four nutlets. We see that happening right here in this diagram. And we see that right here in this picture. Uh, the flowers of mints are often in verticels, which is basically what we see here on marsh mint. Verticels are large clusters of, of flowers that are in the axles of the leaves. So a lot of good things here that help, help us with mints. Next one is the rose family and there's four different subfamilies. Okay. Pardon me? Uh, the next family is the rose family and there's four different subfamilies. So we're gonna take a look at first the main subfamily which is the rose subfamily. And again, you're gonna see lots and lots of stamens. And in this case, in this subfamily, lots and lots of, of separate uh, carpels or simple pistils. And of course, this thing right here, which is the hypanthium, that floral cup. Almost all roses have that. So. The combination of that floral cup and lots and lots of stamens and separate pistils um, and also compound leaves, um, at least in this, this subfamily, lots of compound leaves with stipules. And the stipules are pretty easy to recognize. Here's a compound leaf and the stipules are these little fused appendages that we see down here at the base of the petiole. So great characteristics to help identify this subfamily. The other two subfamilies, I'm not gonna do the apple subfamily, but the other two more common subfamilies, the cherry plums, um, they only have just this one pistol right here. They have hypanthium. Um, and another thing with plums, of course, is you can look at the vegetative um, leaves and quite often on plums, there'll be little glands right at the upper part of the petiole, right, right before the, the petiole joins the blade. Uh, the subfamily that has spirea in it, metal sweet, is this one down here. And you can see it has two separate pistols here and a hypanthium. You can see a cross section right there. Again, that hypanthium, we still, we still see quite a few uh, stamens here, quite a few stamens here. So again, large numbers of stamens, hypanthium, um, that's going to help point you to, to the rose fam family. The legume family or Fabaceae also has um, some subfamilies, uh, three subfamilies. Uh, we're going to take a look at all three of them real quick. The, the P subfamily is the biggest one, and that's this one right here. And um, a really good characteristic for the, this family is this characteristic flower right here, which has has five petals, um, has a bilateral symmetry to it, but it has, um, has this big banner petal 
this is a name for this one. It's a, it like, it's like a big flag. That, that function of that pedal is to be a flag. Then we got some uh, lateral pedals here, wings. And then the, there's two more pedals down here that are fused together and they actually fuse around and sort of conceal the stamens. The, the stamens here are helpful too. There's in this subfamily, there's usually 10 stamens and they're arranged in two groups really. Nine of them are fused together and then there's one by itself. Another thing that's helpful for this subfamily is it's just again, one carpal, just a one carpal all by itself, a simple pistol. Usually uh, compound leaves, uh, that's a pretty good characteristic alternate. There's usually stipules um, with most of these as well. So in that sense, they're kind of like a rose uh, if you're just looking at the, the leaves. Uh, but a lot of uh, legumes will have a pulvinus and a pulvinus is uh, something you'd see on the petiole of the leaf. Uh, it's a, um, usually a pretty conspicuous bulge uh, that occurs either at the, the uh, bottom of the petiole or the top of the petiole where again the petiole meets the blade and its its purpose is to help provide movement. Uh, many of the uh, species in the legumes are able to accomplish uh, movement of the leaf leaflets either you know closing up at night opening up in, at, by, by day um, they may be responding to touch uh, as well so that, that tropism, that ability to move is, is due to the pulvinus. The other two um, subfamilies, the Senna subfamily, partridge pea is a good representative of that. It does have a hypanthium of sorts, it's, it's kind of weak. Uh, and it's sort of bilateral symmetrical. It's not as strongly bilateral as the pea family. Then the other one, the mimosa subfamily is an easy one because it just has a ton of stamens. In fact, when you look at a flower in this subfamily, you mostly, that's all you see. Uh, there's not much else you see. There are some petals and sepals there, but there's so many stamens that they just obscure everything else. And, and both of these two also have uh, very compound leaves. Let's do one more and then we'll take a quick break. Um, next one is a saxifrage family. So hypanthium. We see the hypanthium again here in the floral diagram is a good help here. Uh, there's gonna be just five sepals and petals and they're not gonna be fused. So I, I use the term separate to mean that they're not fused. And the, the, both the sepals and petals have a radial symmetry. The, the combination of the hypanthium and the leaves being mostly basal and having a lot of, most of them have a palmate, palmate venation or palmate uh, lobes, as we see right here. That is a good, again, quick gestalt clue to help you with uh, the saxifrags. Uh, we see um, mitrewort is another example of uh, species in this fam family. Um, this is, a, uh, by the way, this is a Iowa golden saxifrage. It's an endangered species that just grows on the Algipic talus slopes up in uh, northeast Iowa. I I, Iowa. Here's a good example again of that, that um, palmate venation. These aren't really lobed very much, but they do have the palmate venation where the main vein, veins are all coming from the base of the leaf here. So again, that combined with the hypanthium, that floral cup. You can see the floral cup right here, very, very ni nicely. Uh, again, we'll help you with, it, with this, this group. All right, let's take a short break. Give you a chance to get something to drink or stretch. I'll get going again in about uh, four minutes or so.
Are there any questions, Lance? Nope, not that I see. Okay. All right, we'll get going again here. Uh, we've got a few more families to cover. So the next family here, the Violets, Violet ACE. I, I suspect this is one that most of you don't need any help with. Uh, the Gestalt here is that, that very characteristic violet flower, I guess you might say. It does have, uh, again, five sepals and petals. They're all separate, but it's, uh, again, bilateral. And what's important here, of course, is that lower petal has a spur on it, which really, again, is what characterizes the violet flower. Uh, this is a nectar spur where nectar that comes from these nectaries here, these are nectaries that are associated with the lower stamens. Uh, those nectaries produce nectar and that drips down into the spur and it collects there. And that's what the insects, of course, are, are looking for. Uh, violets also have very different um, um, Andresium, that's the male part of the flower. They have five stamens, but the, the stamens are really, really short and they kind of, they don't fuse, but they converge around the pistil. They surround the pistil and uh, kind of make almost a, a tube that the pistil comes through then or, or is, is um, positioned in. There are three carpels that fuse to make the ovary and it's somewhat of a three-sided structure. When the uh, ovary matures into a capsule, uh, it'll split open like this, three parts to it, of course, and the seeds will fall out. And these seeds, by the way, have a caruncle. A caruncle is this little white fleshy tissue that we see right here on the tip of the seed. It's an outgrowth from the surface of the seed. And of course, that's a caruncle or a eliosome, uh, arrows. Those, these are all things that are associated with seeds that attract ants. Um, Ants like to utilize that as a food source, high proteins, high fats and oils. So they'll, they'll pick up the seeds and carry them and they'll, they'll discard the seed and, and just use that caruncle. Of course, the, the, the leaves, they are mostly basal leaves in the violet family, which you know, can help to identify them when you don't have any flowers. You have um, not always, but often have sort of a heart-shaped look to them. But there's, there's many violet species that do not have that, that characteristic heart shape that you see with the, the common blue vi violet. Some violets like the downy yellow violet actually have an upright stem and have al alternate leaves then. All right, uh, the next one is the uh, Onagracee evening primrose. This is another pretty easy family. It has a very well-developed hypanthium. Uh, it's always gonna have Again, it's kind of like the mustard, so we have four sepals and four petals. You know, having four sepals and petals is much more unusual than five. Five is uh, lots and lots of flowers have five. Lots and lots of species have five. So when you have four, that really helps narrow it down a lot. So the four uh, petals and sepals, perianth parts that, uh, again, are separate, not fused. They're radial, uh, usually four or eight stamens as well. And then this hypanthium, here we see the, the again, this, this symbol here means that the ovary is inferior when it has that rectangle going across it like that. And you can see in the common evening primrose, it really, really is inferior. <clears throat> Excuse me, the ovary is clear down here. There's, there's the ovary. This is all flower tube here. And so the ovary is way below the, all the other parts of the flower. Uh, petals and the corolla and the sepals and the calyx. Uh, and that's, again, that's a good characteristic for the family as well. If you see uh, some seeds, they often have some hairs, a tuft of hairs, that's what comos means, a tuft of hairs, at least some of them do. Again, underlying means sometimes. Uh, that's especially true with the um, willow herbs. You see a picture of a willow herb right here. 
And that's, that shows again, the, the capsule uh, splitting open. Usually the capsules again are fairly long because the uh, ovary becomes fairly long. There's a picture of willow herb uh, in the ovary here forming. Again, very much inferior to the other flower parts. All right, moving on to the pink family, Caryophyllaceae. This one has some really good uh, characteristics too. We see that we have three different floral diagrams here, just to again show you a little bit of the variation in the family. But one of the one of the most solid characteristics really uh, is the fact that what you're seeing all through these pictures, uh, many of the species in genera will have petals, five petals, and they'll be separate. They're not fused. They'll be radial um, in terms of their sym symmetry, but they're notched. They, they're, they're cut into. So although you just have five petals here, almost looks like, there, looks like there's 10. That's one petal right there with, with a notch in it. And these are notched so deep over here that it really does look like there's 10, but, but there's not, there's only five. The notch goes almost to the bottom. Of course, starry campion has lots of notches and it. it makes kind of a fringe uh, on the outer edge of the petals. So that's a really good one for carry-offs. Um, many of the carry-offs are, are kind of um, really successional ruderal species. So you do see things like Serratium and, and Stellaria as, as kind of weedy species. <clears throat> uh, Polygonaceae. Buckwheat family is next. Um, oops. Oh, the other thing that's I got to mention is it's right down here. The stem nodes are kind of swollen. So we see the nodes right here. The nodes are where the leaves are attached. You can see how it's kind of enlarged right there. That's another good characteristic for them. Now the buckwheats. And the buckwheats, um, this is going to include uh, Rumex, the docks, uh, the smart weeds, Persicaria and the knotweeds polygonum, for the most part, those, those three groups. Uh, another really, really good vegetative character here is this thing called an ochria. The ochria is seen right here on pepper smartweed. Uh, an ochria is basically stipules that are at the base of the leaf here that um, join or fuse together and elongate and basically form a sheath that's present around the lower part of the inner node, right above where a leaf is attached. This, this membranous tissue right here. This particular ochria has bristles that are coming off the top of it right here. And that's a good characteristic to help figure out which smart weed species you, you've got. So uh, that's probably one of the best characteristics, a good, good quick gestalt uh, to tell you which family you've got when you see that. Uh, some other things here. Um, well, the akines are a pretty good characteristic, these fruits over here. The flowers are usually always pretty small, uh, not real conspicuous. Water smartweed is, has got some color in it. A lot of times the flowers are somewhat whitish or, or greenish and, and fairly small. All right, let's move on to uh, the Boraginaceae. And the Boraginaceae and the mints have some things in common. One thing right off the top will be the fact, again, that they have a fruit that's a schizocarp that breaks apart into four nutlets. And again, we can see that happening right here um, with the fruit breaking apart and the four nutlets right there in the center. Uh, a good gestalt characteristic for this is just as the inflorescence is beginning to take shape and form, you see this example up here with heliotrope, um, many of the species have what's called a scorpoid sign. And that's a fancy way of just saying the inflorescence has this sort of fiddlehead like of uh, approach to it in terms of how it develops and forms. You can see it's kind of looks like a fiddlehead here. It's wrapped up in a, in a uh, scorpion you know, kind of fashion. And what will happen as it develops is this will just uncurl and will stretch all the way out. And, and we'll see then you, you won't see this thing, it'll, it'll look more like, like this. Another thing is that we're gonna see, a, um, and this was true with the, the mints as well, but you look closely at the flower, the stamens, there's five stamens. This term epipetalus means that the stamens are fused to the petals. 
Here you can see, that's what this is showing here, those stamens and that line that goes over to the petals. And there's a line between the petals, joining the petals. That means the petals are fused to each other. So there's, there's a tube that's, that's being formed there. You can see the tube right here and we can see the petal, or excuse me, we can see the stamens. There's very short filaments being attached right to the inside of that, that corolla tube. That's a good characteristic again for the, the Boraginaceae and for the mints and also for the um, water leaf fa family as well. What happens in the mints and in, I didn't mention this with the mints, but in this family and in the mints is that, uh, again, we have this thing called a false septa. Um, there's just two carpels. And again, when they join, there should only just be two chambers, but there's four chambers. It goes from two to four chambers because, again, of a false septa that form. And in, the, in both the Boraginaceae and in the mints, it really makes the ovary have a four lobed look to it. The base of the ovary will look, it will be very strongly four lobed. And those four lobes kind of correspond again to the four nut, nut, nutlets that are going to come out of those uh, fruits. Many of the leaves in this family are pretty hairy. Uh, I put in scabrous and hispid here. Um, that is a pretty good characteristic. Almost, almost invariably, the leaves are gonna have some pretty um, rough hairs. All right, uh, the Malvaceae, the mallow family. Uh, this is a pretty easy one too because of a couple of things, uh, gestalt things. The first one is this epicalyx. So it has, it's going to have petals, it's going to have sepals like normal, but in, below the sepals, there are these bracts quite often, and that's called an epicalyx. So it's, it's like an extra calyx that is below the normal calyx. And that's what these dark um, uh, lines right here mean. These, these filled in ones represent bracts, which is what these are here. Uh, but the other thing that's really, really important here is the fact that there's, there's many, many stamens. And the many stamens have their filaments fused into a tube, basically, that surrounds the pistil. You can see that right here. Lots and lots of stamens fused together to form this tube that surrounds the pistil that's right in the middle right there. Uh, you can kind of see a, a cross view of it or horizontal view of it right here. Some of the species like uh, scarlet gold mallow, which is another example of endangered species in Iowa, have these stellate hairs, which are really uh, a good characteristic to again narrow down plants because most plants don't have stellate hairs. They have little hairs here that are kind of branched, so they look like a, a star, hence the name stellate hairs. Also, uh, plants in this family will have again these leaves that are palmately veined or palmately lobed, like that. All right, the uh, cypressaceae, the sedges. So there's lots of stuff we could talk about here, but basically, again, to make it quick and, and just give you some gestalt things, basically, you know, the triangular stems are going to be helpful, uh, but that's not always true, of course. More helpful probably are these closed sheaths, the sheath down here, which is the bottom part of the leaf, basically the lower part of the leaf and um, the part of the leaf that attaches to the stem is, is at the bottom of the sheath. But these sheaths, again, are, are closed, leaf sheaths closed. That means that the, the leaf sheaths are completely fused around their edges so that it's a solid piece of tissue there that surrounds the, uh, the, the stem. The other thing, and, and in this, this is a lot to try to get in just in a couple of minutes, but, um, the, the flowers, of course, in the Cyperaceae are really, really reduced. There aren't any sepals or petals, uh, to, to at least not in the, the true form of what a sepal or petal looks like. Sometimes they're, the sepals are basically modified or reduced to just bristles or scales. Because again, this is, this is a plant that's wind pollinated, of course, and so it doesn't need, need that, that colorful um, perianth to attract in, insects. Uh, so that's important. And then the tiny flowers, the tiny little flowers that are all arranged in these things called spikelets. Here's an example of a spikelet here. Here's another spikelet here in, in spike rush.
this is an example of um, the um, perigenia that make up sedges. So again, that's that's a characteristic just of the sedge group. Uh, it's not true for all of the all of the species in in this family, but those that are carex. Polymoniaceae, the phlox family, where again we have um, five sepals, five petals. Uh, here, the sepals, when they're fused, you can see these, you can kind of see it right here. You can see these, this transparent, the margins of the sepals where they fuse together are transparent. So you can see in all of these uh, calyxes here, the sepals where they're fused, you see those, that, that, that transparent stripe. Uh, so that's that's a pretty helpful characteristic if you need some help there. Uh, that's true for all of the phlox family, or excuse me, phlox uh, genus at least. Polymoniaceae also includes Jacob's ladder, polymonium. Uh, they don't have that characteristic quite so much. But they do have uh, the other characteristics you see in the floral diagram here, the three fused carpels, again, the epipetalous stamens that are, again, fused to the corolla. Um, the, Corolla is somewhat funnel form, look like a, looks like a funnel over here in the phlox genus, uh, it's, it's called sour form. And that's a word that means trumpet shaped. The, the corolla is fused again into a really slender tube. You can see how slender that tube is right there. Very slender tube. And then at the top of the tube, it, the, the corolla lobes flare out, kind of like again, a, a trumpet. Hence, hence the name silver form. So the grasses, another complicated one, of course, and, and uh, again, hard to try to characterize just in a few minutes or so, but here um, some important things are gonna be the sheaths. Again, here's a nicer example of how a leaf sheath works, basically. This is the base of the leaf right here that's attached to the node. The first part of the leaf forms this sheath, goes up the stem a ways, and then it uh, changes to the blade, which is, of course, the photosynthetic part. Uh, having an open sheath combined with a ligule, and here's two pictures of ligules. This one, a little membrane uh, right here, and this one, a, a row of hairs. That ligule is positioned right at the junction between the top of the sheath and the lowest part of the blade. Pick up any grass and except for one genus, every grass is going to have a ligule. So that's about as diagnostic as you can get. You don't even need to have any of the spikelets or uh, other flower parts. The flowers are complicated. They, they are arranged in spikelets like the sedges, the cyperaceae, but they have more uh, empty scales basically. They've got a couple of things called glooms. The green and yellow arrows are pointing to glooms these things right here. And then each flower is situated between two bracts. One of them is called the lemma. That's the purple one right here. And the other one is called the palea. That's the red one. So you can see that you know, it, it can get more complicated when it comes to figuring out which grass you've got. But it's not too hard to say that you've got a grass. The uh, carrot family, Apiaceae, very, again, another family that many of you probably know pretty well. It's pretty easy to to identify by the, in this case, the inflorescence. The flowers are tiny. They're really, really small. I mean, I've got some good information here about the flowers. Uh, the fact that they have a stylopodium. Um, the stylopodium is shown up here in this caraway. Uh, that's basically just a, a bulge or swollen tissue at the base of the styles. That's what a, that's what a stylopodium is. But again, you don't really need to see all that stuff. It's really small. If you've got a compound umbel, uh, then you've got an APACE, basically. Uh, that is, again, a, a very important uh, characteristic and is pretty true for almost all of the species. So a compound umbel is basically when you've got uh, little tiny flowers that have their, the flower stem of each flower comes together and meets in a point. That's what's happening right here. Those are a and same thing right here. Those are a whole group of little tiny flowers. And the flower stems called the pedicels are all attached to a common point right there and that one right there. And then these things are, which is called a ray, 
they're attached. There's many of them and they're all attached to a common point right there or right there. So there's an umble within an umble. And that's why it's called a compound um, umble. Again, um, clear, clearly a, a really good characteristic to identify uh, something that's in this family. And the next one, I, don't, I won't spend much time on because again, the milkweed, um, this is, and by the way, the milkweed is going to, milkweed family is going to go away. Milkweeds are going to be going into the Apostinaceae family. Uh, they'll be combined with them. Um, they used to be separate, but uh, there'll be a subfamily within the Apostinaceae because they are quite different from the dog banes in, in many ways. But for now, uh, you know, if you can recognize the milkweed, then you, you know that it's going to be at least in that family. Uh, the milkweed flower is very characteristic, and you know it just got the characteristic uh, corona. Uh, these hoods up here, uh, the the petals are actually pointing downward in most cases. Here, these are the petals going downward, and then these up here are the hoods, or what make the crown or corona. And there's often horns, little projections. These the green arrows point into a horn right there little horns that come out of the center of those of those hoods. Given that, that's all you really need to know again to pin down a milkweed. And of course, the next family, the Aceraceae, is another example of a family that is, is huge and has a lot of variation. Um, there's a lot that goes on here as well. To summarize it, basically, you know, we've you got a situation where you have a, an inflorescence that's called a head inflorescence. And it's subtended by this thing called an involucre. So here's an involucre, all of these greenish bracts, green colored bracts, they can be various sizes. So they sit and surround the receptacle of the flower um, where the florets, and there's three different versions here, but this one right here, which is called a radiate head, same thing that oxide has here and is also pictured right here has two kinds of flowers, it has these disc flowers in the center, disc flowers. And here's what a disc floret looks like. Uh, here's the floral formula for a disc floret. And then it also has ray flowers. Here's a ray flower right here. here the ray flowers are these bigger yellow um, corollas right here that surround it. So the two different kinds of flowers combined together to make a, what's called a radiate head. This is what's probably the most common, and many of the species in the Asteraceae have this, take this form. A smaller group, um, like the blazing stars and, and um, oh, bone sets and things like that, only have disc flowers. They're called a discoid head, because there's only disc flowers, so only this kind of flower is present. There are no ray flowers. Then the other option uh, right down here is this thing called a ligulate floret. Uh, a ligulate floret kind of looks like a ray, uh, like a ray flower, but it is, is different on a number of ways. Radiate uh, flowers with these ray flowers, these are only pistillate. Ray flowers are only female. A ligulate one is bisexual. And um, this one has three fused petals. This one has five fused petals. So there is a difference, but uh, things in the lettuce family, the dandelions, excuse me, in the lettuce subfamily, uh, dandelions all have a ligulate head. So if you can recognize these three subfamilies, basically you're gonna recognize the bulk of the Aceraceae. Uh, Primulaceae, uh, the loose dries, they um, have been, now, they're now kind of combined with the Mersinaceae. So again, changes happening. This is the only family in all of these that have what's called free central placentation. So in this situation, it's, it's really kind of hard to tell how many carpels were fused together to form the ovary or the pistil. Uh, usually it's, it's five, but you really can't tell that um, because there's no way of really seeing that. What happens is that it's fused in a way that all of the, all of the of ovules are attached to a central column, basically. And that's what free central placentation means. Um, this is a group that has heterostyle. So heterostyle is when uh, there's two different 
versions of an individual. Some individuals have pin flowers where the style is taller than the stamens and anthers. Other individuals in the same population have thrum flowers where the style is much, much shorter than the location of the stamens. And what this is meant to do is to help promote cross-pollination. Uh, shooting star is in that family. All right, we're getting towards the end of our time. We've got just a few more. Uh, Lily ACE is, is one that's, again, it's a big, it was first defined as a very big family. And that's the approach shown in this diagram. Senso lato means that it's very broadly encompassing. It's, it's defined to include lots of species. The, that's the traditional way it's been defined. And you can see uh, that's the way the FNA does it. If you use that definition of the family, it's huge, it's got 280 genera and over 4,000 species, but it's been drastically overhauled. And now most versions, most, most you know, the current understanding of this family is that it's a much smaller family. Senso stricto is the result of, of much um, molecular work to again, figure out what the relationships really are. And so most of the, species that were in the old version of the Liliaceae have gone to other families. And the, the more strict version of it now, worldwide there's only 19 genera and 610 species. And in Iowa, we only have two genera, Lilium and Erythronium. But the basic characteristics of the Liliaceae still kind of hold for those, of course, though. The, the three sepals, the three petals that are uh, very much alike in form and shape and color. The sepals are petaloid. We call them tepals in. So there's six tepals here, but three of them are actually sepals and three are petals. The fact that there's six stamens, the fact that there's three carpels that are fused, um, those are all good characteristics for the Liliaceae. And then the orchids, um, if you see a, a plant with really crazy looking flower. <laughs> That's the easiest way to say it, maybe. Um, complicated flower, you're probably looking at an or orchid. Um, they have the one most important characteristic, again, and this, this will identify an orchid almost all the time, is that yes, they've got three sepals, and yes, they've got three petals. They're usually mostly separate. Uh, the sepals sometimes can be fused partly. The sepals often have a petal-like look to them, um, but one of the three petals will be much different than the other two. That's called the lip or the labellum. And that's what we see here in this lady slipper. Uh, that's what we see here. That's what we see here in this prairie fringed orchid. So that, that's the only, the one characteristic that really all you need really uh, to figure out, it's an orchid. This is Great Plains Ladies Tress right here. The lip is right here. Two more, uh, Euphorbia ACE, the Spurge family, uh, pretty common. There's three genera that are pretty common, Euphorbia, Croton, and Acalypha. Those are the three genera we have for the most part. Um, you're gonna see here uh, a very easy one. That's the latex. Most spurges have some milk when you tear the leaf or puncture the stem a little bit, there'll be some milk. So like a milkweed in that sense, but flower wise, they don't look anything like a milkweed, of course. In fact, most of the flowers in uh, Euphorbiaceae are actually uh, imperfect flowers, meaning that there's, they're separate sex flowers. Here we see that right here. Here's a male flower, because all we see here are stamens. Here's a female flower, because all we see here is a pistil. We see a, a, a situation where the ovary is formed from three carpels fused together. The Euphorbia genus has a really complicated inflorescence called a cyathium. I won't go into the details of that. It's got um, some glands associated with it. Uh, but again, uh, don't really necessarily need that. You, when you, you see the milk and you can recognize again that you've got multiple uh, Im imperfect flowers that should help point towards euphorbia. And then the last one, uh, Hypericaceae. Now it's also 
some people in, include it in Clusi ACE. Uh, it is, whoops, I went the wrong way, sorry. It's another easy one because uh, it's the stamens that can really help give it away. Uh, you can see in this floral diagram right here, uh, stamens are usually five to many, but they're usually fused into three or five different groups. As we see here, there's five groups right here, uh, fused into, into these groups called fascicles. Uh, so again, that some of them are gonna have black dots on the leaves, not all of them, or clear dots. That's what uh, that means there, punk tape needs dots. Uh, also, the leaves are almost always uh, simple and opposite and usually sessile. Uh, that's also a pretty good help. So great St. John's wort is a good example here. And then this is uh, the other genus we have in Iowa, triadenum. All right. Well, that was a quick run through, but we are just getting started as this last slide shows. There are lots and lots more plant families out there, of course, more than we can do in one night. The Cactaceae here the Fumaraceae right here, uh, the Plantagaceae. Uh, so this used to be in the Scrupulariaceae, Penstemons, but now they're in the Plantagenaceae, the Lithraceae right here uh, with uh, wing loose drive, and the Aralaceae here with ginseng. So great, if there's time for questions, uh, I'll take a few if you need to go. Thanks again for coming this evening. Hopefully you picked up something that will help you here uh, with your plant identification this summer. Thanks for coming. Yeah, we do have a few questions in the chat. So the first one is, weren't milkweeds once in the apostinaceae family? Well, so they, the milkweeds originally were separated into their own family, the Asclepiodaceae, like I presented here. But as I said, uh, the new version of that group, when Flora of North America comes out, that part of uh, that, that, that volume isn't quite done yet. It hasn't been published, but you can look in, you can, there's a place on the website for Flora of North America. You can look and see what's going to be published and how it's going to be published. And when that does come out, the milkweeds are going to be put into the Apostinaceae group. So the, the milkweeds will be in the dogbane family. It'll be the dogbane family. The milkweeds will form a subfamily in that family family though, because again, the milkweeds are different from the dog beans in, in some character, in, in some ways, but they are united in the fact that uh, the, the, there are two carpels that are separate at their bases. And as, as you go up those carpels, they become fused together at the top. Dog beans have that and the milkweeds have that. So that's what unites them into <laughs> the one family. But then the milkweeds have lots of other things that the dog baits don't have. Next question is, why are there so many changes to the taxa? Is it driven by genetic research, changes in taxonomic rules, or something else? It's mostly driven by research that's being done constantly by systematists, plant scientists who are looking at the, looking at the genes. Now, you know, the way that classification has always been done, you know, since the beginning of time, basically, has been based on morphology, because that's all we could do. You look at a plant, and if you, you, you look at the morphology of the flowers and of the plant, and you start trying to measure, or you measure a lot of things, you measure all kinds of things, then you do this uh, num numerical analysis of all these numbers, and you can start trying to see which species fit together, you know, which are morphologically more alike. So you start putting those into families or into a ge 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 genus. And so that's how things always were, were done basically when it became possible to look at DNA and to look at genes, uh, you know, and look at a more, you might say a more direct line of evidence about evolution and relationships, uh, we saw, lots of things change. And yes, most of all of this revision is mainly always being driven by research that's come out to show that the phylogenetic relationships based on genes and, and chloroplast DNA and mitochondrial DNA and such is not the same as what it looks like morphologically. Cool. 
Okay. So somebody's asking if for a total beginner, um, is there a place they can go to read up on basic structure to have a better, have an easier time with identification of plants? Yeah. So, you know, that's what that's what these workshops I do in the summer are all about to try to help, you know, at a, at a much slower pace because it's over three days, of course. Um, yeah, there's definitely lots of web uh, sources. I, I, I could uh, put some together and send them to whom, whomever, whoever that is wants to send me an email. I, I'll be glad to do that. Um, there's new, quite a few websites that have good uh, glossaries that help define terms, good diagrams and pictures of this, all the morphology uh, that we've been talking about. Because yes, when you start trying to identify plants, and this is going to be true with most anything, you, you right away run up against a wall often if you're a beginner because there's going to be a lot of terminology that's not familiar. And, you know, we can't really avoid it. Uh, when, you're, when you're trying to describe plants and, and tell people how to separate two species, you, you have to have names for the things you're talking about. You have to have adjectives for the the way a characteristic is expressed. And so the, the terminology that's involved, you know, I'm teaching field botany right now, and the terminology that's involved, I, I, we, we, we spend at least two weeks in, in class going over terminology and morphology um, in order to get the students up to a point where they can appreciate a little bit more, you know, what, um, what I'm saying to them when I describe a plant. But yeah, there, there's help out, out there. Um, just have to find it. Um, someone asked if you can expand on the classes that you mentioned this summer. Okay, so I will be teaching, I know for sure, uh, one workshop actually over there in Lance's home area at Hitchcock uh, Nature Area, north of Council Bluffs by Crescent. It's going to be a, a grass workshop. So my workshops are aimed to be a, a three-day workshop. Um, we, we meet Tuesday morning um, and go till Thursday afternoon. So right in the middle of the week. And of course, the idea is to be in a place where we can go out and we can see a lot of stuff. Uh, I bring scopes so that everybody will have a dissecting scope and they can we take time looking at, at examples of the plants we're trying to figure out learning again how to use keys, learning how to learn the language that's involved in describing these, these plants. Uh, so the work, the one workshop for sure, again, is going to be at Hitchcock on, on grasses. They're usually aimed at some family, you know, narrowed down to a, a group. I'm working on another one, though, with Polk County. I, I, we sort of thought we were going to do this like two years ago, and then the pandemic came. So it got shoved back and then it got shoved back again last year. And so I, I contacted Doug Sheely uh, and asked him if he wanted to go forward this summer with it, but he hasn't gotten back to me. But that workshop is going to be um, all things plants. So that one's going to be designed to be like a, a primer on botany. Uh, there'll be plant ID in there, a fair amount of that. And that's what we'll be doing when we go out in the field. These workshops, of course, involve a lot of time out uh, hiking about and, and exploring the natural areas wherever we are. But I'm also going to be talking a lot about, kind of like we're going to be doing in here in a couple of nights at least, we're going to be talking about plant diversity, plant evolution, plant ecology, uh, how plants adapt for their environments. Uh, so just a little bit broader uh, look at plants, because one of the things that um, I, <laughs> one reason I, I do all of this stuff basically is to to try to lessen the amount of plant blindness that's out there. Plant blindness was a catchphrase, I guess you might call it, a phrase that was um, invented, you know, about a decade ago or so, 15 years ago by some botanists who just kind of got tired of, of seeing uh, and, and interacting with so many people that didn't have a clue about hardly any, anything about plants. You know, they there's these green things that are out there in the landscape, but that's about all they know, you know. So the idea is just to get a better understanding, appreciation of plants just in general. And all things plants is, is a way of trying to doing that by covering a lot of different things. So there, 
those are the only two I have right now. Are those open to anyone? Um, can anybody attend those? Are they public? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, that's what they are. Yep, uh, there'll there'll be announcements that go on the Iowa Native Plant List about them. There'll be a flyer that that will be posted. Um, they'll be advertised through the Iowa Native Plant Society. And the other the other thing, of course, beginners should do. Uh, one of the best ways to really start, you know, getting into understanding plant identification and appreciating plants is go on a field trip. Uh, there's lots of field trip opportunities. I and mean, they're, they're going to be more this coming summer than there have been. Uh, Iowa Native Plant Society newsletter just came out and it lists a few of those. I do, uh, I do uh, field trips at Doolittle Prairie every month, every fourth Thursday of the month. And I know that Mark Leshy is going to do one at Kelso Prairie in June. And I just was talking with uh, Tom Shearer from INPS about doing, um, there's going to be a, field trip at Tipton Prairie in Greene County, and there'll probably be another INS, INPS field trip up at um, Mossy Glen in Northeast Iowa towards the end of the summer. So, and then the Iowa Prairie Network might be having some field trips too. So uh, if you have an opportunity, you know, go out on one of these field trips. Um, I think, you know, at least when I lead a field trip, uh, I'm really trying to help people understand, uh, you know, as much as I can about what they're seeing and and how to identify plants and, and not just identifying plants, but, but talking about their biology, how they fit into their environment. And we often talk about management a lot too, of course, uh, if you have some land and you're trying to manage a restoration or a remnant or something. So take advantage of those if you can. Okay, last question I see right now is any lakeside classes this summer? Yeah, Lakeside has a schedule that's already up on their website. Um, I, I am teaching uh, plant taxonomy up there. Uh, that is a great place to take a course on plant ID. Uh, I, I am field, teaching field botany at Drake right now. You know, I'm stuck in the middle of winter, of course, here, and all we can really do now outside is look at conifers and twigs, but and that, and that's fine. But Lakeside during the summertime, I mean, it's just, you know, you got great natural areas all over the place up there, prairies, wetlands, forests. And um, the course will, it's a four week long course as all Lakeside, well, most Lakeside courses are. It's, it is intensive, eight hours a day, five days a week for four weeks, four credits, if you're looking for college credit. But, you know, it is um, it's something that anyone can take. You don't have to be a student. Um, I've had adults in my classes up there before as well, so. And then there's you know there's other Lakeside classes too. I don't know for sure what other ones, but if you go to Lakeside Lab website and look at 2022 classes, you should see a list of, of what's going to be taught. That do it. Yeah, Glenn, are you asking about these classes? <laughs> If you want to sign up for any of the other ones we're doing with Tom over the next two months, um, I just posted the link in the chat. So it's the same one where you registered for this one. And then probably next week sometime we'll have the this recording up on that website too. So you'll be able to watch that and I'll put the handout up there too. What is next week's? I don't remember. Uh, uh next week's is P family, the base E. Oh, okay. We'll go into the Fab AC better. Right. Yeah, we. Uh, yep, that's all we got for now. So thanks everybody right. for joining and I'll be following. Oh, uh, yeah, up. yeah. Thanks a lot for uh, joining this evening and see you next week, maybe. Bye. Thanks, Welcome.